deadly riot over the government's plan to avoid defaulting on its loans. Is that the unemployment keeps rising and it has to keep rising just because we, we have an excess so much supply so of many. goods, which is this is all borrowed money that our and that kids debt is owned by banks in other countries. Filter cigarette that delivers the taste, and I only buy malt liquor. Are you hot? <laughs> Quite some time ago, by a psychologist. I first learned it from my grandmother. Now, my grandmother was a wonderful person. She taught me how to play the game Monopoly. She understood that the name of the game is to acquire. She would accumulate everything she could, and eventually she became the master of the board. And then she would always say the same thing to me. She'd look at me and she'd say, one day you'll learn to play the game. One summer I played Monopoly almost every day, all day long. And that summer I learned to play the game. I came to understand the only way to win is to make a total commitment to acquisition. I came to understand that money and possessions, that's the way that you keep score. And by the end of that summer, I was more ruthless than my grandmother. I was ready to bend the rules if I had to to win that game. And I sat down with her to play that fall. I took everything she had. I watched her give her last dollar and quit in utter defeat. And then she had one more thing to teach me. Then she said, now it all goes back in the box. All those houses and hotels, all the railroads and utility companies, all that property and all that wonderful money, now it all goes back in the box. None of it was really yours. You got all heated up about it for a while, but it was around a long time before you sat down at the board, and it will be here after you're gone. Players come and players go. Houses and cars, titles and clothes, even your body. Because the fact is that everything I clutch and consume and hoard is going to go back in the box and I'm going to lose it all. You have to ask yourself, when you finally get the ultimate promotion, when you've made the ultimate purchase, when you buy the ultimate home, when you have stored up financial security and climbed the ladder of success to the highest rung you can possibly climb it, and the thrill wears off, and it will wear off, then what? How far do you have to walk down that road before you see where it leads? Surely you understand, it'll never be enough. So you have to ask yourself the question, what matters?
was a young man growing up in New York City, I refused to pledge allegiance to the flag. Of course, I was sent to the principal's office, and he asked me, why don't you want to pledge allegiance? Everybody does. I said, everybody once believed the earth was flat, but that doesn't make it so. I explained that America owed everything it has to other cultures and other nations, and that I would rather pledge allegiance to the earth and everyone on it. Needless to say, it wasn't long before I left school entirely, and I set up a lab in my bedroom. There I began to learn about science and nature. I realized then that the universe is governed by laws and that the human being, along with society itself, was not exempt from these laws. Then came the crash of 1929, which began what we now call the Great Depression. I found it difficult to understand why millions were out of work, homeless, starving, while all the factories were sitting there. The resources were unchanged. It was then that I realized that the rules of the economic game were inherently invalid. Shortly after came World War II, where various nations took turns systematically destroying each other. I later calculated that all the destruction and wasted resources spent on that war could have easily provided for every human need on the planet. Since that time, I have watched humanity set the stage for its own extinction. I have watched as the precious finite resources are perpetually wasted and destroyed in the name of profit and free markets. I have watched the social values of society be reduced into a base artificiality of materialism and mindless consumption. And I have watched as the monetary powers control the political structure of supposedly free societies. I'm 94 years old now, and I'm afraid my disposition is the same as it was 75 years ago. This shit's got to go. So you're a scientist and somewhere along the way hammered into your head is the inevitable nature versus nurture and that's at least up there with Coke versus Pepsi or Greeks versus Trojans. So nature versus nurture, this by now utterly oversimplifying view of where influences are, influences on how a cell deals with an energy crisis up to what makes us who we are and the most individualistic levels of personality. Um, and what you've got is this complete false dichotomy built around nature as deterministic at the very bottom of all the causality of life as DNA and the code of codes and the holy grail and everything is driven by it and at the other end a much more social science perspective which is we are social organisms and biology is for slime molds humans are free of biology and obviously both views are nonsense what you see instead is it is virtually impossible to understand how biology works outside the context of environment. One of the most crazy-making yet widespread and potentially dangerous notions is, oh, that behavior is genetic. 
Now, what does that mean? It means all sorts of subtle stuff if you sort of know modern biology, but for most people out there, what it winds up meaning is uh, a deterministic view of life, one rooted in biology and genetics, genes equal things that can't be changed genes equal things that are inevitable and that you might as well not waste resources trying to fix, might as well not put societal energies into trying to improve because it's inevitable, it's unchangeable. And that is sheer nonsense. It is widely thought that uh, conditions like ADHD are genetically programmed, conditions like schizophrenia are genetically programmed. The truth is the opposite. Nothing is genetically programmed. They're very rare diseases. I mean, a small handful, extremely um, sparsely represented in the population that are tru truly genetically determined. Most complex conditions might have a predisposition that is a genetic component but a predisposition is not the same as a predetermination. The whole uh, search for the source of diseases in the genome uh, was doomed to failure before anybody even thought of it, because most diseases are not genetically predetermined. Heart disease, cancer, strokes, um, uh, rheumatoid conditions, autoimmune conditions in general, um, mental health conditions, addictions, these are none of them genetically determined. Uh, breast cancer, for example, out of 100 women with breast cancer, only seven will carry the breast cancer genes. 93 do not. And out of 100 women who do have the genes, not all of them will get cancer. Genes are not just things that make us behave in a particular way regardless of our environment. Genes give us different ways of responding to our environment. Um, and uh, in fact, it looks as if some of the early childhood influences of a kind of child rearing uh, affect gene expression, actually turning on and off different genes um, to put you on a different development, developmental track, which may suit the kind of world you've got to deal with. So, for example, uh, a study done in Montreal uh, with suicide victims looked at autopsies of the brains of these people. And it turned out that if a suicide victim, these are usually young adults, had been abused as children, the abuse actually caused a genetic change in the brain that was absent in the brains of people who had not been abused. But that's an epigenetic effect. Epi means on top of, so that, so that the epigenetic influence is what happens environmentally to either uh, activate or deactivate certain genes. In New Zealand, there's a study that was done in a town called Dunedin, um, in which uh, a few thousand individuals were studied from birth up to their, into their 20s. What they found was that they could identify a genetic mutation, an abnormal gene, which did have some relation to the predisposition to commit violence but only if the individual had also been subjected to severe child abuse. In other words, a child with this abnormal gene would be no more likely to be violent than anybody else. And in fact, they actually had a lower rate of violence than people with normal genes, as long as they weren't abused as children. Great additional example of the ways in which genes are not be all end all. Fancy technique where you can take a specific gene out of a mouse, that mouse and its descendants will not have that gene, you have knocked out that gene. So there's this one gene that codes for a protein that has something to do with learning and memory, and this fabulous demonstration, knock out that gene and you have a mouse that doesn't learn as well. Ooh, a genetic basis for intelligence. What was much less appreciated in that landmark study that got picked up by the media left and right is take those genetically impaired mice and raise them in a much more enriched, stimulating environment than your normal mice in a lab cage, and they completely overcame that deficit. So when one says in a contemporary sense that, oh, this behavior is genetic, 
to the extent that that's even a valid sort of phrase to use, what you're saying is there is a genetic contribution to how this organism responds to environment. Genes may influence the readiness with which an organism will deal with a certain environmental challenge. You know, that's not the version most people have in their minds. And not to be too soapboxing, but run with the old sort of version of it's genetic and it's not that far from a history of eugenics and things of that sort. Um, it's a widespread misconception and it's a potentially fairly dangerous one. One reason that the sort of biological explanation for violence, uh, one reason that hypothesis is potentially dangerous, it's not just misleading, it can really do harm, is because if you believe that, you could very easily say, well, there's nothing we can do to change the predisposition people have to becoming violent. All we can do if somebody becomes violent is punish them, you know, lock them up or execute them. But we don't need to worry about changing the social environment or the social preconditions that may lead people to become violent because that's irrelevant. The genetic argument allows us the luxury of ignoring past and present historical and social factors. And in the words of uh, Louis Menard, he wrote in the New Yorker, very astutely, he said, it's all in the genes, an explanation for the way things are that does not threaten the way things are. Why should someone feel unhappy or engage in antisocial behavior when that person is living in the freest and most prosperous nation on earth? It can't be the system. There must be a flaw in the wiring somewhere, which is a good way of putting it. So the genetic argument is simply a cop-out, uh, which allows us to ignore the social and uh, economic and political factors that, in fact, underlie um, many uh, troublesome behaviors. Addictions are usually uh, considered to be a drug-related issue, but looking at it more broadly, I define addiction as any behavior that is associated with uh, craving, with temporary relief, and with long-term negative consequences, along with an impairment of control over it so that the person wishes to give it, give it up or promises to do so, but can't follow through. And when you understand that, then you can see that there are many more addictions than simply those related to drugs. So there's workaholism, there's addiction to shopping, to the internet, to video games. There's the addiction to power. People have power, but they want more and more and more. Nothing is ever enough for them. Uh, acquisition, corporations that must own more and more. The addiction to oil, but at least to the wealth and to the products made accessible to us by oil. Look at the negative consequences on the environment. Uh, now very, we're destroying the very earth that we inhabit for the sake of that addiction. Now these addictions are far more devastating in their social consequences than the cocaine or heroin habits of my downtown Eastside patients. Yet they're rewarded and considered to be respectable. The tobacco company executive that shows a higher profit will get a much bigger reward. He doesn't face any negative consequences legally or otherwise. In fact, he's a respected member of the board of several other corporations. But tobacco smoke-related diseases kill five and a half million people around the world every year. Uh, in the United States, they kill 400,000 people a year. And these people are addicted to what? To profit. To such a degree are they addicted that they're actually in denial about the impact of their uh, activities, which is typical for addicts, is denial. And that's a respectable one. It's respectable to be addicted to profit, no matter what the cost. So what is acceptable and what is respectable is a highly arbitrary phenomenon in our society. And it seems like the greater the harm, the more respectable the addiction. There's a general myth that drugs in themselves are addictive. In fact, the war on drugs is predicated on the idea that if you interdict the sources of drugs, you can deal with addiction that way. Now, um, if we understand addiction in a broader sense, we see that nothing in itself is addictive. No substance, no drug is, is by itself addictive, and no behavior is by itself addictive. Many people can go shopping without becoming shopaholics. 
Not everybody becomes a food addict. Not everyone who drinks a glass of wine becomes an alcoholic. So the real issue is what makes people susceptible, because it's the combination of a susceptible individual and the potentially addictive substance or behavior that actually then makes for the for full flowering of addiction. In short, it's not the drug that's addictive, it's the question of the susceptibility of the individual to being addicted to a particular substance or behavior. If we wish to understand what then makes us, some people susceptible, we actually have to look at their life experience. The uh, old idea, although it's old, but it's still broadly held that addictions are due to some genetic cause is simply scientifically untenable. What the case is actually is that certain life experiences make people susceptible. Life experiences that not only shape the person's uh, personality and, and psychological needs, but also their very brains in certain ways. And that process begins in utero. shown, for example, that if you stress mothers during pregnancy, their children are more likely to have traits that predispose them to addictions. And that's because uh, development is shaped by the psychological and social environment. So the biology of human beings is very much affected by and um, programmed by their life experiences beginning in utero. Environment does not begin at birth. Environment begins as soon as you have an environment, as soon as you are fetus, you are subject to whatever information is coming through mom's circulations, hormones, levels of nutrients. Great landmark example of this, something called the Dutch hunger winter. 1944, Nazis occupying Holland. For a bunch of reasons, they decide to take all the food and divert it to Germany. For three months, everybody there is starving. Tens of thousands of people starve to death. What the Dutch hunger winter effect is, if you were a second or third trimester fetus during the starvation, your body learned something very unique during that time. As it turns out, second, third trimester, something that your body is going about trying to learn about the environment is, well, how menacing of a place is it out there? How plentiful? How, how much nutrients am I getting by way of mom's circulation? Be a fetus who is starving during that time and your body programs forever after to be really, really, really stingy with your sugar and fat and, and what you do is you store every bit of it. Be a Dutch hunger winter fetus and half a century later, everything else being equal, you are more likely to have high blood pressure, obesity or metabolic syndrome. That is environment coming in a very unexpected place. You can stress animals in a laboratory when they're pregnant and their offspring will be more likely to use cocaine and alcohol as adults. You can stress human mothers, for example in a British study, uh, women who are abused in pregnancy will have higher levels of the stress hormone cortisol in their placenta at birth and their children are more likely to have conditions that predispose them to addictions by age seven or eight. So in utero stress uh, already prepares the ground for all kinds of mental health issues. Israeli study done prior uh, on, on children born to mothers who were, preg who were pregnant prior to the onset of the uh, 1967 war. Uh, these women, of course, are very stressed, and their offspring have a higher incidence of schizophrenia than the average cohort. So there's plenty of evidence now that prenatal effects have a huge impact on the developing human being. The point about human development, and specifically human brain development, is that it occurs mostly under the impact of the environment, and mostly after birth. Now, if you compare us to a horse, uh, which can run on the first day of life, we see that we are very undeveloped. We can't develop, we can't uh, muster that much neurological coordination, balance, muscle strength, visual acuity, until a year and a half, two years. And that's because the brain development that in the horse happens in the safety of the womb, in a human being has to happen after birth. And that has to do with simple evolutionary logic as the head gets larger, which is what makes us into human beings. The burgeoning of the forebrain is what creates the, the human species, actually. Um, at the same time, we walk on two legs, so our pelvis narrows to accommodate that. So now we have a narrower pelvis, a larger head. Bingo, we have to be born prematurely. And that means that the brain development that in other animals, 
occurs in utero in us, occurs after birth. And much of that under the impact of the environment. And um, the concept of neural Darwinism simply means that the circuits that get the appropriate input from the environment will develop optimally, and the ones that don't will either not develop optimally or perhaps not at all. If you take a child with perfectly good eyes at birth and you put him in a dark room for five years, he'll be blind thereafter for the rest of his life because the circuits of vision require light waves for their development. And without that, even the rudimentary circuits present and active at birth will atrophy and die, and new ones will not develop. There's a significant way in which early experiences shape adult behavior. And even and especially early experiences for which there's no recall memory. It turns out that there are two kinds of memory. There is explicit memory, which is recall. This is when you can call back facts, details, episodes, circumstances. But the structure in the brain, which is called the hippocampus, which encodes recall memory, it doesn't even begin to develop fully until a year and a half, and it's not fully developed until much later, which is why hardly anybody has any recall memory prior to 18 months. But there's another kind of memory, which is called implicit memory, which is in fact an emotional memory, where the emotional impact and the interpretation that the child makes of those emotional experiences is ingrained in the brain in the form of nerve circuits ready to fire without specific recall. So I'll give you a clear example, people who are adopted have a lifelong sense of rejection very often. They can't recall the adoption, they can't recall the separation of a birth mother, because there's nothing there to recall with. But the emotional memory of separation and rejection is deeply embedded in their brains. Hence, they're much more likely to experience a sense of rejection and a great emotional upset when they perceive themselves as being rejected than other people. That's not unique to people who are adopted, but it's particularly strong in them because of this function of implicit memory. People who are addicted, given that they, according to all the research literature, certainly in my experience, the hardcore addicts all, uh, virtually were all uh, significantly abused as children or suffered severe emotional loss. Their emotional or implicit memories are those of a world that's not safe and not, not helpful, caregivers who are not to be trusted, and relationships that are not uh, safe enough to open up to vulnerably. And hence, their responses tend to be to keep themselves separate from really intimate relationships, uh, not to trust caregivers, doctors, and other people who are trying to help them, and generally see the world as an unsafe place. And that's strictly a function of implicit memory, which sometimes has to do with incidents they don't even recall. Infants who are born premature are often in incubators and in various types of gadgetry and machinery for weeks and perhaps months. It's not known that if these children are touched and stroked on the back for just 10 minutes a day, that promotes the brain development. So human touch is essential for development. And in fact, infants who are never picked up will actually die. That's how much of a fundamental need being held is to human beings. In our society, there's an unfortunate tendency to tell parents not to pick up their kids, not to hold them, not to um, uh, pick up babies who are crying for fear of spoiling them, or to, to encourage them to sleep through the night. You don't pick them up, which is just the opposite of what the child needs. And these children might go back to sleep because they give up, and their brains just shut down as a way of defending against the vulnerability of being abandoned, really, by their parents but their implicit memories will be that of a world that doesn't give a damn. A lot of these uh, differences uh, are structured very early in life. Uh, in a way, the, if you like, the parental experience of adversity, how tough life is or how easy it is, is passed on to children whether through maternal depression or parents being bad-tempered with their kids because they've had a hard day or just being too tired at the end of the day. And these have very powerful effects, uh, programming children's development, which we know a lot about now. But that's early sensitivity isn't just an evolutionary mistake. 
It exists again in many different species, even seedlings as an early adaptive process to the kind of environment they're growing up in. But for humans, the adaptation is to the quality of social relations. And so uh, early life, how nurturing or how much conflict, how much attention you get, um, is a taster of the kind of world you may be growing up in. Are you growing up in a world where you have to fight for what you can get, watch your back, fend for yourself, learn not to trust others? Or are you growing up in a society where you depend on reciprocity, mutuality, cooperation, where empathy is important, where your security depends on good relations with other people? And that needs a, a very different uh, emotional and cognitive development. And that's what the early sensitivity is about. And par parenting is almost, uh, quite unconsciously, a system for passing on that experience to children of the kind of world they're in. The great British child psychiatrist, D.W. Winnicott, said that fundamentally two things can go wrong in childhood. One is when things happen that shouldn't happen, and then things that should happen but don't. And the first category is the traumatic and abusive and abandonment experiences of my downtown east side patients and of many addicts. That's what shouldn't happen but did. But then there is the non-stressed, attuned, non-distracted attention of the parent that every child needs. That very often children don't get. They're not abused, they're not neglected, and, and they're not traumatized. But what should happen, the presence of the emotionally available nurturing parent just is not available to them because of the stresses in our society and the parenting environment. And the psychologist um, Alan Shore calls that proximal abandonment. When the, present, the parent is physically present, but emotionally absent. I have spent, uh, oh, roughly the last 40 years of my life um, working with the most violent people our society produces, murderers, rapists, and so on, in an attempt to understand what causes this violence. I discovered that the most violent of the criminals in our prisons had themselves been victims of a degree of child abuse that was beyond the scale of what I ever thought of applying the term child abuse to. I had no idea of the depth of the depravity with which children in our society are all too often treated. Uh, the most violent people I saw were themselves the survivors of their own attempted murder, often at the hands of their parents or other people in their social environment, or were the survivors of family members who had been killed, their closest family members, by, by other people. The Buddha argued uh, um, that everything depends on everything else. He says the one contains the many and the many contains the one. That you can't understand anything uh, in isolation from its environment. The leaf contains the sun, the sky, and the earth, obviously. Uh, this has not been shown to be true, of course, all around, and specifically when it comes to human development, uh, the modern scientific term for it is the biopsychosocial nature of human development, which says that the biology of human beings uh, depends very much on their interaction with the social and psychological environment. And specifically, the psychiatrist and researcher, uh, Daniel Siegel, at the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, has coined the phrase, interpersonal neurobiology, which means to say that the way that our nervous system functions depends very much on our personal relationships. In the first place with the parenting caregivers, and in the second place with other important attachment figures in our lives, and in the third place with our entire culture. So that you can't separate the neurological functioning of a human being from the environment in which he or she grew up in and continues to exist in. And uh, this is true throughout the life cycle. It's particularly true when you're dependent and helpless and your brain is developing, but it's true even in adults and even at the end of life. Human beings have lived in almost every kind of society, from uh, the most egalitarian um, hunting and gathering societies seem to have been very egalitarian, for instance, based on food sharing, gift exchange, small bands of people living predominantly off of foraging, um, but 
little bit of hunting. Predominantly among people you have at the least known your entire life, if not surrounded by third cousins or closer, in a world in which there is a great deal of fluidity between different groups, in a world in which there is not a whole lot in terms of material culture, this is how humans have spent most of their hominid history. And no surprise, that makes for a very different world. One of the things you get as a result of that is far less violence. Organized group violence is not something that occurred at that time of human history, and that seems quite clear. So where did we go wrong? Violence is not uh, universal. It's not symmetrically distributed throughout the human race. There is a huge variation in the amount of violence in different societies. There are some societies that have virtually no violence. There are others that uh, destroy themselves. Some of the um, Anabaptist religious groups that are complete strict pacifists, like the Amish, the Mennonites, the Hutterites. Among some of these groups, the Hutterites, uh, there are no recorded cases of homicide. Um, uh, during uh, uh, our major wars, like World War II, where people were being drafted, they would refuse to serve in the military. They would go to prison rather than serve in the military. In the kibbutzim in Israel, the level of violence is so low that the criminal courts there will often send violent offenders, people who have committed crimes, to live on the kibbutzim in order to learn how to live a nonviolent life, because that's the way people live there. So we are amply shaped by society. Our societies in the broader sense, including our theological, our metaphysical, our linguistic influences, etc., our societies help shape us as to whether or not we think life is basically about sin or about beauty, whether the afterlife will carry a price for how we live our lives or if it's irrelevant. In a broad sort of way, different large societies could be termed as individualistic or collectivist, and you get very different people and different mindsets, and I suspect different brains coming along with that. We in America are in one of the most individualistic of societies, and capitalism being a system that allows you to go higher and higher up a, a potential pyramid, and the deal is it comes with fewer and fewer safety nets. By definition, the more stratified a society is, the fewer people you have as peers, the fewer people with whom you have symmetrical, reciprocal relationships, and instead all you have are differing spots and endless hierarchies, and a world in which you have few reciprocal partners is a world with a lot less altruism. All right, so this brings us to a total impossible juncture, which is to try to make sense in a perspective of science as to what the nature is of human nature. You know, on a certain level, the nature of our nature is not to be con particularly constrained by our nature. Um, we come up with more social variability than any species out there. More systems of belief, of styles, of family structures, of ways of raising children. The capacity for variety that we have is extraordinary. In a society which is predicated on competition and uh, really very often the ruthless exploitation of one human being by another, the profiteering of other people's problems, and very often the creation of problems for the purpose of profiteering. The ruling ideology will very often justify that behavior by appeals to some fundamental and unalterable human nature. So the myth in our society is that people are competitive by nature and that they're individualistic and that they're selfish. The real uh, reality is quite the opposite. We have certain human needs. The only way that you can talk about human nature concretely is by recognizing that there's certain human needs. We have a human need for companionship and for close contact, to be loved, to be attached to, to be accepted, to be seen, to be received for who we are. If those needs are met, we, we develop into people who are compassionate and cooperative and, um, and who have empathy for other people. So, the opposite that we often see in our society is in fact the distortion of human nature precisely because so few people have their needs met.
So yes, you can talk about human nature, but only in a sense of basic human needs that are instinctively evoked, or I should say certain human needs that lead to certain traits if they are met, and a different set of traits if they are denied. So, when we recognize the fact that the human organism, which has a great deal of adaptive flexibility allowing us to survive in many different conditions, is also rigidly programmed for certain environmental requirements or human needs, a social imperative begins to emerge. Just as our bodies require physical nutrients, the human brain demands positive forms of environmental stimulus at all stages of development while also needing to be protected from other negative forms of stimulus. And if things that should happen do not, or if things that shouldn't happen do, it is now apparent that the door can be opened for not only a cascade of mental and physical diseases, but many detrimental human behaviors as well. So as we turn our perspective now outward and take account for the state of affairs today, we must ask the question, is the condition we have created in the modern world actually supporting our health? Is the bedrock of our socioeconomic system acting as a positive force for human and social development and progress? Or is the foundational gravitation of our society actually going against the core evolutionary requirements needed to create and maintain our personal and social well-being?